Well, if you've got your Bibles, I, I'm going to ask you this morning, if you would, to take them to the book of 2 Corinthians 5. And a couple of things that I do want to I do want to mention uh, before we begin the message this morning. Uh, as you saw the, uh, the video clip that was played during the announcements, I do want to encourage you, if you're not plugged in somewhere else on Sunday night uh, for, for adults, uh, I encourage you to uh, participate in that course called Foundations. That'll be a great, that'll be a great study. I believe it's a 12-week study. Uh, Bob Barber, Bob is here somewhere. Where are you at, Bob? There you are. Bob, wave at us. Bob, wave at us. There he is. Bob will be leading that study, facilitating that study, uh, done by Answers in Genesis. Ken Ham, an incredible uh, look at the foundations of our nation, but also in how do we reach our nation. So I encourage you to, to get plugged in and participate in that study that will begin next week. As Christopher mentioned tonight, I'll be doing a workshop on evangelism. Again, that's down at the Heritage Center, uh, and all of that, I believe, is a, is a good lead into where we're going to go today uh, in our, our message this morning. But as you came in this morning, as we have done now for several years, I believe one of the, the capstones of our church, I believe uh, one of the uh, many reasons the Lord continues to bless us is our involvement in and our commitment to prayer. And so I want to encourage you to participate with us over the next 40 days. Uh, again, we've done this, I don't know, for maybe eight or so years. Uh, we're, we're asking you to commit over the next 40 days to be praying specifically for several things. Uh, we've provided for you a prayer guide to do so. And along with that, that you might consider uh, the discipline of fasting, how the Lord might uh, use that in your life individually as a person, uh, in your family's life, in the life of our church. If you've never participated in the discipline of fasting in the front uh, of this prayer guide, there's some information about the discipline of fasting. Uh, we find it all throughout Scripture. Uh, I promise you it will stretch you spiritually if you commit to fasting. You say, well, when we fast, does it have to be food? It doesn't have to be food, uh, but after uh, Christmas and, and New Year's and all of that, it might be a good idea. Uh, because, to be really quite honest, it's really difficult to give up on food, is it not? It really is. I promise you, just go a day or two without eating, and you'll find out really quick, like, how committed you are to your flesh. That's true. We, we, I, I have found that true in my own life. Just go without food for a day or two, then all of a sudden, your flesh begins to groan. Literally groan. And uh, so I encourage you, there's other things that you can fast besides food. Uh, what about fasting social media for the next 40 days? That might be for some of you more difficult than fasting food. I had a chiropractor friend in South Carolina who was a news junkie, loved to watch the news, and he told me, he said, you know, Pastor, he said, uh, it's more difficult for me to fast news than it is food. And so that's what he did uh, when, he, when he was directed to fast by the Lord. And so there's a number of things that you can do. Uh, maybe medically for you because you're on medications and other things, you can't fast food. Uh, but uh, there's many other things that you can commit to going without so that you might uh, increase uh, the awareness and the intensity of your prayer life. I promise you, if you'll commit to it and you'll stick with it, several things will happen. One, the devil will fight you tooth and nail. If you commit to it, the devil's going to come against you and put everything else in your pathway that you can imagine. And so I, I'm just challenging you as a church. I'm taking the challenge personally. I want you to know that. And I'm challenging you as a church for the next 40 days to pray and to fast that we would see God do greater things than he has ever done in the life and the ministry and the work of this church, but also in your life personally, that we could accomplish the task that God has called us to accomplish. And I believe if we are faithful, I know that he is faithful. So that's my challenge to you this morning in respect to prayer. Uh, that table as you came in, just behind the, the, where the books are, 
Uh, there's a calendar there. On each of those days, there's a couple of sticky notes. If you want to take one of those sticky notes, maybe you say, well, I'll, just, I'll take a day a week. Uh, my, my prayer is that we'll have somebody fasting in some fashion or another at least every day over the next 40 days. And so maybe you just want to put a check mark on that day you're taking or jot, jot your initials there. It's not about making a big public display of it. That's not the point at all. But I'm just challenging you uh, to do so and participate with us. And so take your time as you're leaving this morning to go by, pick up a prayer guide, and uh, take a day, uh, maybe just a day a week and do so. Also, there's a table over by the Welcome Center that has several uh, missional prayer resources in regards to several ways that you can be praying for missionaries uh, and the 1040 window, the unreached people group. So pick up one of those prayer resources and make a commitment to be praying for uh, missions as well uh, over the next 40 days. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 5. This morning I want to talk to you about, about our reach. Uh, as you know, we have a, a paradigm here at Ebenezer uh, we, we have used this now for a couple of years. It's reach, grow, serve, worship. You can see those around the, around the sanctuary this morning. Reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grow in the knowledge of Christ. Serve as the hands and feet of Christ. And worship Christ seated on his throne. Why? Because everything that we do here, our absolute intended purpose is that it all is Christocentric, all centered around the person of Jesus Christ. Because I believe, without any question, Jesus is the game changer. Jesus is the one who makes the difference. It's not me or you or anybody else in the world. It's not the great quarterback who won the game or the great running back who scored all of the touchdowns. That's not the game changer in life. Jesus is the great game changer. And if you've ever met him and you know him personally, I promise you this, he has transformed your life. And he's calling you to do a number of things. And as we've been asking this question as a church, what next, there are a number of things that we want to continue to do. And we want to continue to do them well, and one of those is to continue to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the question is this morning, what is the driving force behind our reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Second Corinthians 5, beginning in verse number 1, For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up in life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are a home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now I want you to jump in the text all the way down to verse number 17. Therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are what? Become what? New. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and as a result has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Did you catch that? Now then we are what? We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. 
For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is absolutely, I believe without any question, one of the greatest biblical mandates that we find. That's that we reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, There are some basics that go along with this concept of reach. I don't think anyone would, would argue, sitting here this morning, that the Bible has clearly given us a mandate to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark's gospel, chapter 16 and verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How can we forget Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20? All power is given unto you in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The passage we read as we opened this morning in Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 10 through 17. How in the world are they going to hear unless someone takes the gospel to them? The world is waiting for somebody to tell them about Jesus Christ. And guess what? We have the privilege and we have the responsibility to take the good news into a lost and dying world. Matthew chapter number 9, verses 37 and 38. The problem is this. The fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Jesus made that comment all the way back in Matthew's gospel, and that comment is still true today. The problem is not the lostness of the world. The problem is not the fact that there aren't enough people to reach. The problem is there are not enough laborers who are committed to take the gospel of Jesus Christ into a lost and dying world with great intentionality. It's one thing for us this morning to stand here or sit here and listen and hear about it and talk about it. It's an entirely different thing for us to walk out the doors of this church and go into a world tomorrow morning and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and be intentional about taking the gospel to a lost world. But that's our responsibility. How can we forget Romans chapter 1 and verse 16? The Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I'm afraid, again, in Christianity, one of the problems is we're not ashamed when we're in church, but we're ashamed when we're out there. That's why I think we've lost our boldness. Because somehow, some way, the devil has duped us into believing, and we like to believe uh, the government and everybody else who says, you need to keep your religion to yourself. No! I, I don't think that is what God said in his word, is it, church? He didn't tell us to keep quiet about your religion. And by the way, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship, which is entirely different than just religion. I have a relationship with a holy God because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. And by the way, what I'm sharing with you and what we have a responsibility to share with others is greater news than anybody else in the world has to share. It's not about convincing you, and if I don't convince you, uh, then, then I'm going to kill you. No, it's about telling you about the love of Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, and then it's up to you to determine and decide whether or not you're going to answer the call or not. That's the greatest news in all of the world. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, how can we forget Acts? When Jesus said, as the Holy Spirit came there in Acts 1 and 2, I want you to go, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. You see, the basics of reach is very clear. The biblical mandate is very clear. And as we just read here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we have been called, as we'll examine in just a moment, We have been called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. The biblical mandate is absolutely clear. 
The statistical data is profound. I shared some of this last week, but I want to share it again. There are 97,000 people within a 15-mile radius of our church. There's 11.6 million people in Ohio. There's 319 million in the U.S. There are 7.3 billion people globally. There are 11,505 people groups globally. There are 6,819 people groups with less than 2% of their group evangelized in the world. That's astounding. You see, the problem is not necessarily here. We've become so gospel-hardened in America that most Americans don't want to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. They, they have a knowledge of God, as Paul says over in, in Romans chapter number, uh, chapter number 10, they have a knowledge or a zeal of God, uh, but, they're, but they're ignorant about the truth. Here, here in America, uh, we have become, we have gotten to the point where people just believe that, oh yeah, I know God and that's good enough. I'm telling you, listen church, knowing about God is not the answer. It's knowing who Jesus Christ is and repenting of your sin and accepting what he has done for you. But in the world, there is a great, great problem in the world because so many have never even heard about who Jesus Christ is. As a matter of fact, there are 3,126 unreached and unengaged people groups who have never had anyone take the gospel message to them. Think about that. You see, for us, that's hard for us to imagine or even conceptualize. You can turn on the TV and on your direct TV or whatever you have, and you can go through the religious channels and you can hear preacher after preacher after preacher you know some of them are, are whacked out i understand that but you can hear a lot of preachers talking a lot about the bible uh, you can go on the street corners of most any city or any town and you can find at least one good church that's preaching the gospel of jesus christ most of our homes have a stack of bibles and you can go to walmart and buy one or, or the dollar store and buy one for a dollar you see in america we have a lot of the gospel but many just don't want to hear it anymore. And yet there are literally hundreds of thousands and millions of people around the world who have never yet one time ever heard the mention of the name of Jesus Christ. You see, the statistical data is profound. I would say to you the tools are abundant. It's estimated that over 9 billion Bibles have been printed since the printing press started cranking out Bibles. 9 billion Bibles. There are untold hundreds of billions, I think maybe even trillions of gospel tracts and all kinds of gospel literature that's been printed and available for distribution. The internet literally gives us access and availability to the gospel anywhere, anytime, any place, virtually in any spot in the world. There is every kind of media opportunity and outlet where we can present the gospel everywhere. This morning, right now, on 98.3, the local rock and roll station, hallelujah, we're preaching the gospel. And th those opportunities are everywhere. The resources, I believe the resources are adequate. It's estimated based on the average household income in the United States that annually Americans earn $6,188,000,000,000. That's reported income based on average household income. Globally, it's $24,333,000,000,000. And that's reported income. This doesn't include the billions that went unreported. And by the way, we all have the same resource of time. We all have 86,400 seconds every day. All of us. No one can say, well, you've got more time than I've got time. No. We all have the same amount of time. The question is, is what am I doing with the resources, financial resources, and the time resources that God has given to me and to you? 
And how am I using those resources to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and distribute it to a lost and dying world? As Christ followers, by the way, I would remind you as well that we all have the same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that you have as a believer, the Holy Spirit that I have as a believer is the same. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is not powerless. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is not mute. The Holy Spirit is everything that we need to accomplish the task that God has called us to accomplish. And one of the primary tasks and responsibility of every believer is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will say this to you and to me as well. We have no excuse. None. If we are not sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are simply failing at the core of what God has called us to do. And the world is dying and going to hell in a handbasket. So what is the driving force behind the reach? I believe there are two driving forces. There are many that we could extrapolate from this text, but I believe there are two primary driving forces in this text in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I want you to see the first one with me as we read the first six verses of this text. Our immortality is a reality. Do you understand that? Let me say that one more time. Our immortality is a reality. That means this. That means this morning that you're going to live forever. You're going to live forever. Let, let me illustrate it this way, because a lot of people say, wait a minute, wait, that's not true. Everybody's not going to, oh yes, everyone is going to live forever. Les, come here. Terry, come here. So here we have represented a winner and a loser, right? Hallelujah, all right? <laughs> but now listen, listen carefully. Everyone is going to live forever. Now, now at some point, at some juncture, at some time, in some place, I don't know when it's going to be, but both of these guys are going to be laying down. I want you to go over there and lay down, Les. I want you to lay down right there. Just lay down. It's not hard, just lay down. Just lay down. I want you to fold your hands, put them over your. They usually don't fold your feet in the coffin, all right? There we go. Do it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> At some point in time, this is, you're going you're gonna to walk by their coffin, you're going to see them. By the way, at some point in time, someone's going to walk by your coffin as well. So, but now you say, well, wait a minute. I thought you said immortality is a reality. It is a, it is a reality. I, I want to, first of all, let's talk about the believer's immortality. So, so let's say for sake of illustration that less is the believer. He knows Christ. Terry is not. Again, let me say this again. They're both going to live forever. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 1, I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul says. He begins by saying this, For we know. That's an interesting word that carries with it the concept of confidence. We know this. Well, Paul, what is it that we know? He says, we know that if our earthly tabernacle dissolves away, which by the way, we know it will, then guess what? As a believer, he's speaking as a believer. As a believer, then guess what? We've got a better building coming. A new building, a new body coming. And it's not going to pass away or fade away. We have confidence in that. Listen, church. One of the driving forces behind why you and I ought to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that we know we're going to live forever. 
And if I know I'm going to live forever, and I know where I'm going to live forever, then I ought to have the desire to see as many possible people coming with me. We have confidence. But then he says this, we groan for it. Verse 2 and verse 4. On two occasions in this text, he says, we're groaning for it. Man, we're desiring for that time when we can put on this new body or when we will be given this new body or clothed with this new body because we desire something better than what we have. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19 tells us as well, listen, even creation, as I mentioned last week, even creation groans. And what do we have to go along with it? Well, he tells us we have an earnest a promise or an assurance of something to come. Verse 5, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who hath given to us the earnest of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who lives within us. That is, that earnest concept, the idea, it's the Spirit that tells us, yes, I've got something coming that's far better, and that's my guarantee. And I'm going to live forever. Look how the Apostle Paul says that in Ephesians chapter number 1, verses 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wow. Listen, if you know Jesus Christ, your immortality is an absolute reality. But wait a minute. It gets even better. Because our heavenly immortality for the believer has a great benefit package. Let's just quick like, just look at this benefit package. There's going to be no more tears, no more pain, and no more sorrow, according to Revelation 21 and verse 4. There's going to be no separation because death will be conquered, Revelation 20 and verse 6. The best thing about heaven is the presence of the Lord and Savior. It's a beautiful place as described in Revelation 21. There's going to be no more curse, no earthly troubles, no more night, and we're going to receive rewards. Listen, our immortality and the benefit package that we have that's coming in the future in heaven is a glorious thing. And that should be a driving force behind why we have a desire to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, do you realize what you have as a, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ? Why would you not have the desire? Why would I not have the desire for somebody else to know that as well? I've often used the illustration of, listen, if I, if, I had the, if I had the cure for cancer, would I keep it to myself? We have the cure for all of eternity. Our immortality is a reality, and our heavenly, heavenly immortality has a great benefit package. But listen carefully. Immortality is a reality even for those in hell. And by the way, it has its benefits too. Can I share some of those benefits with you for those who will go on in immortality forever because they are without Jesus Christ in a place called hell? The punishment of eternal fire, it's unquenchable fire. There's shame and everlasting contempt. It's a place where the fire is not quenched. It's a place of torment and fire, of everlasting destruction. It's a place where the smoke and torment rises forever and ever. And a lake of burning sulfur where the wicked are tormented day and night forever and 
forever. You see, the punishment of the wicked in hell is never ending. Jesus even tells us and indicates that the punishment of hell is just as everlasting as life in heaven. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25 and verse 46. As a matter of fact, in that same passage in Matthew 25 and verse number 30, it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now understand this. Immortality is a reality. You're going to go on living forever in one of two locations. And so will the rest of the world. You're going to go on living forever in heaven, in the presence of the Lord, or you're going to go on living a life of death and destruction and torment and pain and agony forever in a place called hell. You see, I believe if we know Jesus Christ and we know the reality of our immortality in respect to heaven, then why in the world would we not be more vigilant It's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are lost. If we know and we believe what the Bible says, and we know the reality of the immortality of those who will die and spend a Christless eternity in hell forever in a place of torment, then why in the world would we not be more vigilant at taking the gospel message to a lost and dying world? You see, I believe one of the great driving forces behind why we should be reaching people is because of our immortality. The second thing that I want you to see in this text, guys, you can, you can go, is this. Our role as ambassadors for Christ is a reality. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Verse 18 and verse 19 and verse 20. In all of those verses, he talks about the fact that we have been reconciled to God. As a result of the fact that we have been reconciled, we're called to be ambassadors. You see, we have been made new creatures in Jesus Christ. Verse number 17, do you see that? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Do you you understand what God has done for you? He's made you new. He stripped away the old, which, by the way, was dooming you to a Christless eternity in hell, and he's given you the new, which, by the way, gives you the benefit of eternity in the presence of the Lord in heaven forever. That's what he has done for us, church. If we are in Christ, and he has changed us and transformed us, he has made us new. Wow, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he took the old me and threw it away and gave me a new me. Wow. And therefore the old things are passing away, constantly being stripped away, constantly conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit going on within you. And we've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You understand the absolute enormity of that concept? That you've been reconciled to God 
through Jesus Christ? You say, well, why do I need to be reconciled to God? I've never had a problem with God. Most people don't have a problem with God, do they? Yes, they do. The Apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Romans. He says, listen, you who were enemies of God, listen, when you and I were born dead in trespasses and sin, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 1, you and I were enemies of the living God. He said, wait a minute, I never hated God. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. I don't care how many times, no, you didn't. I'm just telling you, go back and argue with God's word. Yes, you did. You hated God. You were a God hater. But wait a minute. As a result of what Jesus Christ has done for you, it's Christ who has reconciled you to God. He's made that relationship so that you and I are no longer the enemy of the living God. As a matter of fact, the book of James says he calls you a friend. Once you were his enemy, now you're his friend. Wow. And so you've been reconciled. To God through Jesus Christ. And do you see what it says in verse 19? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. What was he not doing? He was not imputing their trespasses unto them. You say, well, is that significant? That's huge. That's enormously significant. Because God withheld doing what you and I deserved. We deserved to have all of our trespasses imputed to us. But instead, guess what he did? He took our sin, our trespasses, and he took them and he laid them on his son, Jesus Christ. That's why verse number 20 says, For he hath made him, speaking of Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him wow because of what jesus christ has done on the cross god has reconciled us to himself through christ and once we were enemies and now we are friends once we are unrighteous now in jesus christ we are righteous wow but wait a minute wait a minute as a result of all of that, guess what he has called you and I to do? The God of the universe. Come here, Tim. I want you to be God this morning, all right? Just for a minute, all right? Come on. The God of the universe, all right, has, has called you. Come here, Mr. Holmes. The God of the universe has says, listen, because I have reconciled you to myself through my son, I now, I am authorizing you and deputizing you to be my ambassador to go out into a lost and dying world. So would you please raise your right hand? Say, I, I. Mr. Holmes, I am now an ambassador of the living God. I understand my responsibility to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ into a lost and dying world. I will do so by the power of the Holy Spirit and without fail until Jesus calls me home. Now, wait a minute. If you know Jesus Christ, you should all be standing with your right hand raised and taking on the enormity of that same oath. Why? Because God 
has made you his ambassador. That's what happened at salvation. You see, salvation isn't, oh, good, I'm no longer going to hell, I'm going to heaven. Woo, yippee skippy. Now listen, I, I'm, I'm grateful I'm not going to hell and I'm going to heaven, but wait a minute, there comes great responsibility with the fact that he has saved you. And that, church, ought to be a driving force behind why we are reaching people. Everybody stand to your feet. I'm going to make this very personal. One, if you do not know Jesus Christ, then let me say this to you very clearly. What you just heard does not apply to you at all. You have no responsibility. You have no need to worry about fulfilling something that you'll never fulfill because you'll never fulfill it without Jesus Christ. And so, this morning, you can walk away with a clear conscience in that respect saying, whew, ha, hallelujah, I'm off the hook. Oh, but wait a minute. If you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ, remember, you're going to go on living forever in a place called hell. And it won't be as Harry Carey quoted several years ago just before his death when he said, I can't wait to get to hell and have a party with my friends. Many of you remember the voice of the Chicago Cubs, Harry Carey. I'm, I'm here to tell you, hell ain't no party. You say, well, whoa, whoa, Pastor, that's a little heavy. You know, you, you're trying to stir up some emotion in me. No, I'm just trying to make sure you understand the truth so that you are without excuse. Apart from Jesus Christ, you will spend an eternity in hell. And I would say to you this morning, if you realize and recognize that you are apart from Christ and you've never surrendered your life to him, would you please, today, receive Jesus Christ? He's waiting with open arms. He's provided the way. The sacrifice is completed. All you have to do is say yes to Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Turn from yourself. And say yes to Christ. In just a moment, we're going to pray. And if your desire this morning is to come to Christ, I would say, come and meet me right here. Let someone open God's word and show you from God's word very carefully and very clearly how you can know Jesus Christ. That's for those of you who may be sitting here or maybe are listening or will be listening. The opportunity to receive Jesus Christ is still open today. But if you're standing here today and you know Christ, I want all of us, and I'm speaking to myself as well. So when the preacher preaches, he preaches to himself as well. I want us to grasp the gravity of our responsibility to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ to be very vigilant with the gospel and sharing the gospel. And I want all of us to know and understand that if you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you've been reconciled by God through Jesus Christ, you're no longer an enemy of God but a friend of God, then you and I have the responsibility to be his ambassadors. And so I would ask you, 
Maybe you've never taken seriously your responsibility as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And so in just a moment, when we begin to pray, if your desire is to say, Lord, I've never really taken this desire, this this responsibility seriously, but, but my desire is to be very, very vigilant in taking the gospel this coming year and reaching people then I just ask you to come and find a place and just pray and say, God, here I am. I'm making that commitment. Or maybe you want to come and renew your commitment to sharing the gospel. So the response is this. One, if you don't know Christ, come and meet me right here. If you're just saying, I just want to come and and renew my commitment to share the gospel, then you just come and, and kneel and pray. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray in this moment by your spirit you would do the work that needs to be done. The invitation has been given. It's your opportunity to respond. You come as the Holy Spirit has directed you. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411.